Okay, so as we saw in the previous section, when we talked about this hypothetical um, tutoring program, where if you score a 70 or below, you get a tutor, and if you score higher than a 70, you don't, the way we measured that causal effect was by seeing a gap between two lines. The main intuition behind all of this regression discontinuity stuff is finding a gap and measuring the size of that gap. And there are tons of different ways of measuring gaps and of uh, drawing different lines around a cutoff. And how you draw those lines really, really matters um, because it'll influence how big of a gap you find. Um, so we need to talk about how to draw lines and how to measure gaps. So we'll do that in this section here. So the main goal for all of this regression discontinuity stuff is you want to measure a gap. Um, for people who are on one side of the threshold, compare them to the people on the other side of the threshold. That gap right there is this lowercase delta. Um, which we talked about in previous sections, that is the causal effect that we care about, measuring that delta or that gap. Um, in the world of regression discontinuity, um, this gap is what we call a local average treatment effect. And we'll talk about why it's local versus a regular average treatment effect in a little bit. Um, so just know that that is, that is the average treatment effect we're trying to find, is this local version, that's the gap. What this looks like graphically is this again. Um, so you compare... Um, you know, the average for one of the groups, either treatment or control, right before the cutoff. And then you compare the other group right after the cutoff and measure that gap. And that is your delta. That is the causal effect. Um, in order to find that, though, you have to draw lines. And um, that size of the gap depends on how you draw the lines. So in this case, we see these lines because um, this line happens to end right there, happens to end right there. Had we drawn this blue line not as steep, but kind of flatter, that would have shrunk that causal effect. Or if we drew this maroon line flatter, that would have also shrunk the causal effect. We could draw this blue line steeper, and that would increase the causal effect. It wouldn't fit the data very well. And then there's some statistical shenanigans that are pretty obvious if you draw a bad line. Um, but how you draw this line really matters. So, um, and it can change that the size of that gap by a lot. And so we have to be very careful about this. The tricky part, though, is that there is no one way, one, no one right way to draw these lines. Um, it really depends on how you want to draw them. Um, and the general kind of best practice for this is to draw a ton of different lines and find all sorts of gaps and then just see how big, see the different ranges of the gaps because there is no one right answer for measuring the size of that gap. So when you're drawing lines, there are a whole bunch of different things you need to, to consider as you're drawing the lines. And we'll talk about each of these in turn here. Um, so you have to make a decision um, between drawing parametric lines and non-parametric lines. And we'll talk about the difference between these. So don't worry if you don't know what those mean. Um, there are different ways of actually measuring that gap. Um, there are bandwidth issues, so how much um, of an area around the cutoff you want to look at. Um, because again, the whole goal is to only look at people close to the cutoff. So you're not going to want to look at people way off on the edges, far away from the cutoff. The whole goal is right up next to it. But how big of a window do you want to look at? That's going to determine kind of how the lines get drawn. And then there's this fun mathy extension here called kernels that determines... Um, kind of like bandwidths, how much weight you want to put on the points that are right next to the cutoff versus the ones that are slightly further off. Um, because sometimes you might want to have tons of importance right on the people who score like 69.9 and 70.1, um, just so that you can compare those people. They're a lot more similar than the people who might get like 65 and 75. They're still kind of close to the cutoff, but they're not as similar as the people right next to the cutoff. And so you can use kernels to make those people right on the edge more important and give them more weight. So let's talk about each of these here. So parametric lines um, are formulas with parameters. That's where the parametric part comes from. Parametric parameters, that's what we have here. Um, you've seen these before. These are just lines. Um, any line that has an equation that looks something like this, these are parametric lines. Um, the parameters are kind of the coefficients here and the, the x values. You might have um, coefficient or you might have exponents, other things. Um, but basically, it's just mathy ways of drawing lines. So if you have a formula like this right here, you have y equals 10 plus 4x. Um, that is a parametric line. 
it means the y-intercept starts at 10. And then, so down here, you can see it starts at 10. And the slope is 4, so that means you're going up 4 over 1, up 4 over 1, up 4 over 1. And that's what builds this whole line. So that's a parametric line um, because it has clear parameters. You can tell somebody this formula. You can put it in a graphing calculator and draw the line. That's what makes a parametric line. Um, they're not just for straight lines. You can make parametric lines curvy if you throw exponents into them or trigonometric functions into them. So both of these are still parametric formulas here. It's just that this one has an x, it has an x squared, it has an x to the seventh. This one has the sine of x, so it's going to have like a wavy line in it. Um, and you can do all sorts of like mathy things to these parameters to make it fit the data better. So if you look at something like this, um, this is curvy, but it's still a parametric line because these are clear parameters here. It's just a math formula. It has a squared term in there so that it curves up, but it fits that those data points really well. Um, here you have a cubed term in here. That way it, it kind of turns at the bottom and it turns at the top, fits the data fairly well there. Um, you can even have like, here's a trigonometric thing. Um, we have 10 plus 4x plus 50 times the sine of x over 4. And so you get this squiggly line here. Um, so rather than having a whole bunch of like x to the 12th or something to make this curve, um, you just throw trigonometry in it and you have a line that is curvy neat. Um, these are all still parametric because they have parameters. They have these x's, they have these coefficients. Um, you can do mathy stuff with them. That's what makes a parametric line parametric. Um, it is important that you get the parameters right, um, that you have enough squareds or cubes and, and other things in there to make it so that the line fits the data. Um, the line needs to fit the data pretty well. If it doesn't, then you'll get weird fits like this. And so this is the, the, the orange line here is, um, it fits this, this squared formula fairly well. This has an x squared in it. The blue line does not have an x squared, so it's just a straight line. Um, and they don't fit very, like the blue line does not fit very well. And so if you um, have, let's pretend there's a discontinuity here at 50, um, that's going to influence the size of the gap there um, just because like this line is not fitting the data very well at all. And so we'll have a gap, but it's not like, it's not aligned with the data. So the gap will be wrong. Um, if we did a discontinuity here with the orange line, that fits the data really well. It'll fit on both sides of the discontinuity and the gap will be more accurate. Um, so you want to make sure the line that you choose fits the data. Um, if you have something like this, um, this is with the blue line. It doesn't fit very well at all. Um, the orange line has the squared term in it, but it's still not fitting very well because it's more curvy. It has two different um, turning points here. So if we put a cubed term in there, then it fits and it's squiggly and that's neat. And so that is what parametric lines are, just math formulas um, that fit the data as close as possible. You can also have non-parametric lines. Um, and these are lines that don't have parameters, which means they don't really have math equations behind them. You can't type a non-parametric line formula into a graphing calculator and see the picture of it. Um, because instead, these depend on the data. And you essentially use the data to find the best fit um, for the whole data across like all of the points. Um, and you often do this with like a window or a moving average. And you just look at a chunk of the data, find the average, and then start drawing a line and kind of follow that average throughout. Um, one of the most common forms of a non-parametric line, you've seen this already in some of your past problem sets when you do like geom smooth with ggplot, unless you tell it to do a linear model and draw a straight line, it'll do a curvy line that tries to fit the data as closely as possible. That curvy line is something called a low S curve, which stands for locally estimated scatterplot smoothing um, or locally weighted scatterplot smoothing. They're basically the same thing. Um, and so what you get is a graph that looks something like this. This purple line here, fits kind of the average points throughout this whole uh, throughout the whole range of x here but there's no formula for it um there's no they you could probably figure it out if you like there are fancy math calculators that would show you a really really long hairy equation with like a billion terms in it um, to be able to figure out that purple line but that purple line isn't coming from any math it's coming from the averages of those points 
So one thing that helps is this animation right here. What you do with low S fitting or with this non-parametric idea is you basically look at just a window of the data. So if you look right here, some of these points are clear and some of the points are orange. The darker orange, uh, the darker the orange is for these dots, the more weight those dots have in influencing the average. And so when I click on play, watch as this window kind of scans across the X value here, and then it's going to draw that line and it's basically calculating the average for each section of this, of this moving window here. And that's what creates the non-parametric line. So this is what it looks like. Um, go. So you can see as you're moving across this window, um, you're only looking at some of the points and looking at the averages of those points. And that is what is creating that low S curve. There's no math behind it. There's no formula. There's no parameters. It's just trying to fit the data as closely as possible. Um, based on this moving average. Um, and so when you compare all of them, this is what you have. If you have a data set that looks like this, blue line definitely doesn't fit very well. Um, that's just a parametric line with just an X in there. It's a straight line, doesn't fit. Um, our orange line has an X squared in there, so it's kind of curvy. Um, that kind of fits. Um, but the purple line here, that's our low S curve. That fits really well. Um, and we're not kind of off um, and not capturing kind of all the general trends here. And so um, in this case, a non-parametric line fits better. So if you want to measure the gap, this is the main thing we care about is measuring the gap. If you're using a parametric line, um, this is just a straight line here, straight line there. So this is a y equals mx plus b type thing, which means it's just a regression model. Um, our goal here is to measure the gap right at the cutoff. The easiest way to do this is with regression, just like we've been doing through with all of these other um, methods, like with diff and diff, you could do the A, B, C, D cells and subtract them and that's tedious, or you can put an interaction term in and then that gives you that diff and diff effect. This is the same idea here. We're not using an interaction term, but we can use a specific indicator variable um, to measure the size of that gap with regression. Um, and the way you do this, is you have to do one thing to your running variable. You have to center it around the threshold. So if you, the, if you look at these five rows here from this fake data set that I made with the entrance exam and the exit exams, um, you can see the entrance exam here. This person scored a 92 on the entrance exam. Neat, that's super high. This person scored a 73. They were just above the threshold. Um, what we wanna do is center this column here around 70. So instead of saying it's a, it's a zero to 100 scale, it's going to be all like plus or minus 70. So what we do is we say, take this column and subtract 70 from it. So with our entrance centered column, now this person, the way we read this score is that they scored 22 points above the threshold. This person scored three points above the threshold. This person scored 16 points under the threshold. This person 28 points above, this person zero, they scored at the threshold. And so they were in the program. Um, so if you can center your running variable, and then if you have an indicator variable that indicates if they got the treatment or not, that's all you need for the regression model to figure out the size of that gap. Um, you need the centered running variable centered around whatever the cut point is, and then a variable that marks whether or not they used the program. Um, and if you include both of those things in a regression model, you get the results that you care about. So this is what it looks like um, with our code here. So here we take this data set called tutoring. We make a new column here called entrance centered, where we take the entrance exam column and subtract 70. That makes it so that everything is centered around the, the, the running variable. So that's how we get this column back here. We just said 92 minus 70, 73 minus 70. 54 minus 70, etc. Then you create a model where we take our outcome, the exit exam, that's the thing we care about. And then we do a regression where we say exit exam is explained by the centered entrance exam and tutoring, whether or not they use the tutoring program. Um, and when we look at the results here, here's our tidy for model one here. This is what we see. Um, let me move myself out of here. We have three different numbers showing up in this regression model. We have an intercept, just like all other regressions. What this represents is the average score 
for the control group or the average score for people who had tutoring at zero and where the entrance centered was zero. So that means people at 70 um, who did not use tutoring. So that means they scored on average 59 points on the exit exam right here. So that's this point right here at the bottom of this no tutor line. That's the intercept. So interestingly, because we centered it, the intercept is no longer kind of the y-intercept back at zero. It is now the y, like where y is, the y-intercept here is at 70 because we centered it there. So where it's crossing there, this intercept, that is the average outcome for people at the cutoff who did not use tutoring. Um, the coefficient here for entrance centered, this is less important. This is just saying that as you start increasing the entrance exam scores, um, your outcome goes up. So for every one point increase in entrance exam scores, your exit exam score goes up by half a point. That's basically what that's saying. We don't care about that um, because sure, there's a slope neat, but that's not our main question. Our main question is the gap. And so this is the main coefficient we care about here. This, because this is an indicator variable, it is a switch. So this means when tutoring is turned on, um, that boosts the average test score by 11 points. And that is the size of the gap right here. So you're going from 59.3 up 11 to 61.3, whatever, 59, 60.3. 59 plus 11 is 60, 70. Wow, math is hard. Um, so that, that's what we're measuring here. You're taking 59 plus 11 is going to be the average outcome right here for the people who use the tutoring. Um, and we're right on the other side of the cutoff there. So that means our causal effect is this coefficient right here. Being in the program using a tutor boosts your final test score by 11 points. That is the causal effect of the program. That's cool. Um, so that, that's how you do it with regression. Um, if you are using a fancier parametric model with like squared terms in there or cubed terms to make it fit better, um, those would go in your model here. You'd have like an entrance centered squared, um, age cubed, other stuff. Um, but then the main thing you care about is still the coefficient for tutoring because that's just um, the change in the intercept because of being in the program. And so that is the main causal effect we're going to look at through all regression models that use parametric models. Um, you can also do this with non-parametric lines. And so here's the squiggly version of it, um, where this has no math formula behind it. This is just kind of fitting the data as closely as possible. Um, you can't use regression for this because there's no math behind it. And so instead, you have to use a package here called RD Robust, And this calculates the size of the gap for you. You don't have to worry about centering anything. You don't need to worry about um, modeling anything. What you basically do is this here. You use the RD robust function. You say what your outcome is. So Y equals your exit exam. You say what your running variable is. So X equals entrance exam. And you tell it the cutoff at 70. And then it does fancy mathy stuff behind the scenes to tell you the gap. And so in the case of a non-parametric model, the gap is 9.9, .9, so 10. Um, whereas before, when we just did the parametric easy regular OLS, the gap was 11. So we have a gap of 10, we have a gap of 11, so it's somewhere around 10 and 11, still positive. Um, so it didn't like switch. Um, here it says it switched, it's negative nine, but that's just because it's dropping from this blue line to the, the no tutor line. So even though it says negative, it's still in effect positive. You just kind of have to look at the picture and see which way it's going. So don't panic if you see that it's completely reversed like that. Um, and so that's how you measure stuff non-parametrically. Um, no regression, you just use this RD robust function. Um, you'll get practice with this in the example page. Um, and that's basically how you do it. So that's how you measure the gaps um, with regression models or with RD robust. Um, another thing you need to care about is this thing called a bandwidth. Um, because in practice, all we really care about are the observations that are right around the cutoff. Observations that are far away don't really matter. We don't want to run a regression with people who scored 100 on the entrance exam or 30 on the entrance exam. We only really want to look at a few people in kind of this narrow area around the cutoff. 
that narrow area is called the bandwidth. It's a window around the cutoff point. And you get to determine the bandwidth. Um, so you might, this isn't the same data, this is some other data where a cutoff is at 10, sure. Um, but if you use a bandwidth of five, then you're basically saying plus or minus five around the cutoff, which means you're gonna throw away all of these points and throw away all these points and only look here. Um, if you do bandwidth of 2.5, that narrows that window down and you throw away even more points. But that gives you kind of better treatment and control groups because these people are far more similar than probably these people and these people. And so you want to kind of narrow the bandwidth to a good level and then make your comparison within that bandwidth. Um, there are fancy algorithms that help determine the optimal width. Um, in the example for today, um, for this session, you'll see how to do that. Um, when you run RD Robust, it will actually tell you what the bandwidth is that it chose. Um, you can choose other versions of it, but it tries to figure out the optimal bandwidth according to a whole bunch of fancy Matthew rules. Um, you can also just use common sense. This is often more practical um, because like for this entrance exam, it probably makes sense to say the cutoff is 70. So let's look at 65 to 75 because that's like a five point range. Um, you'll often know the data better. Um, than the algorithms do. If you have like a GPA cutoff, um, you probably know that like the algorithm might say the best bandwidth is from like 2.62 to 3.94 um, for like a 3.0 cutoff, it's gonna choose weird numbers, which when you're trying to explain the, the findings to an audience, they'll be like, why'd you choose those weird numbers? And so often it, it's better to just say, use common sense. Um, if you have a 3.0 GPA cutoff, maybe look at 2.75 to 3.25 um, because those are kind of logical numbers. Um, you can also, for robustness checks, um, play around with the bandwidth. You can choose a good bandwidth that makes sense. So maybe plus or minus five for this entrance exam idea. And then you can double it and say, what happens to our gap if we expand this bandwidth to plus or minus 10? And what happens if we shrink it down to plus or minus 2.5? Does that influence the size of that gap? And how much does it change the causal effect if we narrow or expand that window? And then that kind of lends credibility to your findings um, because if the gap changes wildly as you're squishing in the bandwidth or expanding it, that's probably a sign that like it's whatever causal effect you have is super dependent on your exact choices which is kind of a more dangerous ground to be on because you can choose whatever you want. And so um, having kind of good solid findings regardless of how narrow or big the bandwidth is around a reasonable area, that gives you more credibility. Um, the last kind of mathy thing you can worry about is this idea of a kernel. Um, and this is the idea that we care most about the observations that are right next to the cutoff. And so what a kernel lets you do is it lets you reweight observations depending on their distance to the cutoff. Um, and so you can give, like if, if your bandwidth, let's say we're looking at um, our 70 point cutoff for this, this entrance exam, and we look at a bandwidth of plus or minus five, so we're looking at 65 to 75. So we're looking at everybody in there, but the people who are getting 65 and 75 probably aren't as comparable as the people getting 69 and 71. Those people are way more comparable. So if we can do something in the model um, to give them more weight and more importance than the people who are on the edges, that's going to help kind of get a more accurate gap. Um, there are different ways of, of weighting people around this cutoff. Um, in the RD robust function, there are three general categories of, of weighting algorithms that you'll see. Um, you can do uniform weighting, you can do triangular weighting, and you can do this fun one here, the Epinechnikov weighting system. Um, essentially what this does, if you look at this plot here, uniform weighting means that people who are basically at 65 and 75, um, they're all going to get the same weight. So everybody in that whole range. So this isn't, this isn't weighting anybody differently. This is just saying everybody in the whole bandwidth is going to have the same importance. With triangular weighting, that's this blue line here. The people who are right at the cutoff, so like the 69.9s and the 70.1s, they're going to get a ton of weight and be super important in the regression model or in the RD robust function. And then as you move further away, that's going to start decreasing. Um, the Epinechnikov 
kernel here is this more rounded one where you still get more importance for the people right on the cutoff, but it's not as high and it doesn't drop down as fast. It kind of flattens out and then drops down. Um, that's basically what's happening here. So if you look at this plot here, this kind of shows a, another way of looking at it. Um, I took all of the numbers off the axis because it doesn't matter. Um, but what this essentially shows is like people, um, here's this cutoff here. Um, and then the color of these dots shows the importance of, of the, the observation, how much weight they're getting. Um, and so if you look at the rectangular version here, all of these points are getting the same weight. It doesn't matter if you're further away um, or right on the line, it's all the same. If you look at the triangular one, the observations that are right at the cutoff, they're getting the highest importance. And then that importance shrinks as you get further away. With the Epinechnikov um, kernel here, the ones that are right on the, the cutoff have high importance, but it's not like the triangular ones that are this bright yellow here. It's more in the orange range, and then it, it kind of tapers off slower. Um, that's basically kind of the differences between these three. Which one should you choose? All of them. <laughs> As you'll see in the example, um, you'll calculate like a ton of different average treatment effects. Um, basically saying, let's play with the bandwidth and let's play with the kernel and let's play with parametric lines and non-parametric lines and just throw everything we can at this gap to see how big it is. Um, and then you'll have a whole bunch of different gap sizes and then in the end, you are just you have some sort of causal effect. Um, you can choose one to report on. You can report a whole range. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, it just is kind of a more robust way of saying like, here's our gap, it's all over the map, but it's kind of within this specific range and that's helpful. So basically th the size of the gap that you measure depends on a whole bunch of things, the line type that you use, the bandwidth that you use, the kernel weighting that you use. And my advice to you is to just try a ton of different combinations because it matters um, and you just wanna see what matters and, and what sticks and what doesn't. So if you look at this, for example, um, this is um, if you choose different lines here. So these are three different parametric lines. Um, we have this red line with a cubed term. We have the orange line with the squared term. And then we just have a straight line. If you zoom in and just look at just around this gap here or just around the cutoff, you can see that the gap is going to be completely different depending on the model that you use. So if you just use a simple line um, a parametric line with no, um, no squares, no cubes or anything, we can see that the gap is going to be huge. Look at the top of this blue line down to the bottom of that blue line. That's a big gap. Um, if instead you use the, the squared model, um, the orange line is under the red line there, and then it ends there. That gap is a lot smaller than the blue gap. Um, and then if you use the cubed model, you have from this line down to that line. And so that gap is bigger than the orange line gap, but smaller than the blue line gap. So which one do you report? Um, probably the, the one that fits the data the best, which is probably the either the red or the orange, not the blue. Um, how do you decide between the red and the orange? You report both and say the causal, or our local average treatment effect, our causal effect ranges between these values. Um, also, like if you do this, um, so this shows kind of if you stick a line on here um, that use the whole range, so this is like a super wide bandwidth. Um, so if the cutoff is at 10, this is basically saying a bandwidth of, of 10. So all like plus or minus 10 all around, that gap is gonna be small. If you limit your bandwidth to just plus or minus five, the gap changes, the gap is suddenly bigger. Um, you can see this darker blue line here. We have a larger gap because we're limiting our data. Um, and so this line is fitting the bandwidth data a lot better um, than trying to fit all of the data. And so in this case, it's probably more accurate to report this dark, um, this dark blue gap here because we're looking at a more narrow um, section of the data here. Um, but you might want to report both and say when bandwidth is 10, here's the gap. When bandwidth is 5, here's the gap. Maybe shrink the bandwidth down to plus or minus 2. Um, I would guess it's probably almost identical to the 5 um, just because the data around the bandwidth or around the cutoff here looks pretty flat. It only starts curving up funny once you get out to the edges here. Um, so you just throw a whole bunch of bandwidths at it and see what happens.
um, and try to try to show the uncertainty in your causal effect here um, because just choosing one value here and reporting that and sticking with it is going to be super subjective in the end because it depends on um, if you're using non-parametric lines or parametric lines or um, how big your bandwidth is or if you're using kernel reweighting right here this is using rectangular kernel stuff so it's not doing any extra weighting but we could throw an Epinetchnikov kernel at it or a triangular kernel at it and that would change the gap um, and that's all subjective decisions um, so just throw a bunch of stuff at it and see what happens <laughs>